Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, IIT Madras, for inviting me to deliver this talk on the day of the 92nd birthday of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. I believe this CML is a memorial talk for that visionary leader who really showed that, that it is possible for us to dream, dream very big. And he used to say that our knowledge is very limited. But what is not limited is our ability to dream. Actually, the knowledge encompasses only a very small segment of uh, the entire knowledge sphere, whereas our dream can encompass the entire universe. So that's the power of the dream. And he's a person who told us that it is, it is for you to dream while you are awake. I think I have been uh, inspired by him, and not just by him alone, those people who worked with him. When I joined ISRO, it was his deputies. They were my bosses. His first deputy, Dr. Srinivasan, I think there are some disturbance to the audio, but it's okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, his first deputy, Dr. Srinivasan, his second deputy, Dr. Madhavan Naya, and my immediate boss, Mr. Ramakrishnan, all were Kalam's chelas once. So uh, I had the fortune to be mentored by people uh, who worked with Kalam, but I had an opportunity to work with him. When I joined 1985 in the organization, he was already moving out to DRDO by that time and trying to create the missile system there, which you all know. He became a missile man much later after being the rocket specialist. See, what I want to talk today, the topic you gave me is from, of, uh, from India to infinity, cosmic voyage of Bharat. And uh, I was thinking, what should I speak on this? If I want to pay true justice to this topic, then I, should I need about uh, almost uh, three hours. But then this speech need to be restricted. So I thought I will speak about the scientific accomplishment and the plans for exploration and what are they waiting for us in, in this domain. Let that be the topic, that's what I thought. So let me begin by speaking about this, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has ever gone before. I think this must be the motto of most of the space exploring, exploring nations, and it's not different for us. But just imagine for a moment where you are, I just showed there the Milky Way galaxy, such a huge one, tens of light years, tens of millions of light years in diameter. In that there is a insignificant star, the sun, and about which we all move around on Earth, and the speck, the dot there, and we are such an insignificant living being there, and speak about the entire universe, and trying to understand the universe. I think we should all get wondered about the structure of the universe, when we start speaking about exploring, exploring space. But of course, the human being has to make these steps slow, slowly every day, going to moon, going to Mars, trying to explore the solar system, trying to go beyond the solar system, maybe study exosolar planets, find a way to go and then make a colony in Mars and later in some planets. Of course, all these are possible by human beings, but then we are making those baby steps today. But before we uh, get into that, I, sh I should speak about you know, what inspired us to start the space program way back in 1970s, 60s and 70s. There was a topic called equatorial ionization anomaly, and that was right on top of the magnetic equator. And this need to be understood. And the cosmic voyage of space started there when some cosmologist at that point in time was trying to understand this phenomena, like Sarah Bhai, and they wanted to establish rocket launching station at Dumba to just to specifically understand this phenomena. What happens at the magnetic equator on top? So they developed the sounding rockets and created the launch station at Dumba, and that started the journey of the rocket technology in India. And the launches of the early rockets started way back in Dumba, where I started my work much later. So you can see Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam sitting there along with uh, Aromu then. Uh, who was his uh, deputy at that time, filling up some payload for launch from the church building 
at Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station, and also the classic picture of some of the rocket parts being carried on the bicycle. You know, it is something very inspirational story wherever we go. And it started with this small rocket launching, but slowly the capacity to build bigger rockets came up, the Rogani series of rockets. And the church building, the class, the, still we have a uh, museum there. And the dedication of the Turles Equatorial Rocket Launching Station to the United Nations. I think these were very important at that point in time. I think all of you know, when India started the space program, the big players, the US and the Russia are loggerheads. They were trying to develop the capacity to build heavier rockets. They wanted to go to moon. And uh, there was the Cold War slowly starting in that sector. And you know, one person, Sarabhai, who was able to influence them and then build the technology to India. The very first rocket we launched was with the help of US, and it, the rocket came from US. The launching computers came from Russia. The ground station equipments came from France. And he was able to make all of them, you know, understand that for India, as an emerging possible potential space for tomorrow need to be helped by these people. And that is the beginning of the space program. And such a person, a visionary, Sarabhai, was able to influence the powerful nations at that point in time. And he was not only doing that, he was bringing space to the UN Forum. The organizations like United Nations Committee for Peaceful Use of Outer Space, uh, which is at Vienna, started by him. And that time, you know, the India was not a space power at all. And people were able to listen to him at that point. I think that is an inspirational story. Today, after doing so much of work in space, we are, we are standing here. Large number of missions of building rockets, satellites, and we have so much of missions done, and also uh, private satellites, which are from the different nations, almost 34 countries' satellites we have launched. Uh, these numbers are still higher. I would have put a pre just previous number. We also did many scientific missions. Many of you know the human space flight related missions, the air breathing launchers, the reusable rockets. And we also launched scientific missions. I think this is very significant and I would like to speak about scientific missions in detail. But if you talk about communication satellites, all of you know what is uh, helping us in terms of the, uh, the television broadcasting, VSAT connectivity, data, uh, internet connectivity and all this backhauled support. That is something which is uh, regularly every space agency does. And there is another domain called remote sensing satellites. This also is done by many, many agencies. But when you look at the scientific missions, it's very, very important. And, and it's not easy for anybody to do, like the missions to moon, missions to Mars, or looking at exosolar planets. And it requires developing complex instruments. And that, that's where we started the program of Chandrayaan-1. When Sarabhai spoke about space program, we never spoke about scientific missions. All the time he spoke about bringing the benefit of space for societal uh, improvement, to help governance, to help disaster warning, to help you know, village resources, to help planning. But then we, while we travel the, through the space, at some point in time, our leadership had the courage to talk about scientific missions. And Chandrayaan-1 was the very important decision in the journey of space program. And today we stand at Chandrayaan-3, the soft landing on the moon. And we are talking about taking human beings to moon. So all this happened because we developed the launch vehicle technology. The rockets are very, very important. And it's a strategic capability. It's not easy for anybody to develop an operational rocket. I think you look around and how many, how many nations have rocket technology? You can count them. Even, even today, you know, uh, the Europeans, their ability to launch rockets have just vanished. The Ariane 5 rocket, which was launched till, the, till now, that it's, it has stopped working. And their next rocket, Ariane 6, is another two years down the line. They don't have a rocket today. The Russians, uh, I think the geopolitical situations have created such a disturbance to them that they are not able to launch. And in US, there is an emergence of private space actors, the SpaceX, the Blue Origin. And in China, you can see there are many, many players coming up. Japan, they struggled so many years to make a successful rocket. And today, I think they have just made their H2B successful. And possibly they may come up with a new generation of rockets. But in India, look at the journey that we have made. Starting from SLV-3, ASLV, GSLV, no sorry, PSLV, GSLV and GSLMR-3. Today we have three operational rockets, all of them going very well. And we inducted a new rocket called SSLV in the midst. I think it's not an easy task for any nation to have a, a fleet of rockets who are designed here. <laughs> Uh, 
And all this came not, uh, not that easily. I think possibly you know the development of solid propulsion technology. I think some of you may be aerospace students who understand what is solid propulsion technology. Starting from a 75 millimeter diameter rocket to a rocket which diam diameter is 3.2 meter in diameter, carrying solid propellants worth mass of almost 200 tons. It looks very simple. You know, when you say you carry 200 tons of propellant, the complexity of engineering is phenomenal. The process of learning the chemical composition of the propellant, its structural integrity, its thermal characteristics, its burning rate, its stability of burning, the materials that goes into manufacturing these rockets, the plants that are required to be realized to realize these rockets in parts, join them together at the joints. It's a very complex technology. Equally complex is a liquid engine technology. But we were helped by, again, people like from France. I think you know there was a cast engine technology which you acquired from France. In fact, Indian engineers and French engineers worked together to create this engine. Possibly many of you may not know. During 80s, this engagement between France and India happened. And they call their engine Viking engine and we call our engine Vikas engine. It is still flying in PSLV and GSLV. But the, uh, the French people have used it for Arian, up to Arian 4 rocket and they discontinued for Arian 5. But we are still using and we have a plan to change it. The cryogenic technology came from the Russians and there was a technology denial to us. When the cryogenic engine technology negotiation was going on between Russia and India, there was some interference from outside and they stopped the technology transfer. And we had to develop it ourselves. And we took almost 20 years to develop this cryogenic engine technology. You know what is the complexity of cryogenic engine technology? The power within that small mass of almost 500 kilogram of engine mass, the power is something like 3.5 megawatt. And the temperature of the liquids that are getting in, you know, cryogenic liquid hydrogen temperature and liquid oxygen temperature, but the combustion products temperatures goes up to 2000 plus, 2500 plus. The speed of the pump are in 40,000 or 50,000 RPM. So uh, the materials that gets into are very high strength you know, materials, very high conductivity materials. Uh, manufacturing is very complex, very precise. So making a cryogenic engine is not an easy task at all. And it took almost 20 years to master us this technology. I also want to tell you, we are moving away from these small things to the exploration now. We are also talking about Gaganyan today. Human flight to space. And then immediately people will ask you this question. Oh, so 1960s, America already did it. They have gone to moon. They have been sending human beings to space. Even now there are people in the International Space Station. What is the big deal today to have a human space flight for India? Because we have never done it before. Have you ever done it before? No. And anybody is going to give you the technology for human space flight? Absolutely not. See, while we started developing the human space flight technology, we started approaching US, we started approaching Russia, and we went to Rus Europeans. Why don't you share some knowledge on this? Why don't you help us in developing this? Absolutely no help. It's not going to come. They said, of course, we will discuss, we will consider, we will take it some time to develop it for you. So they are engaging in discussions but not really, really helping us in, in, in building it. So it has to be done by ourselves. And you know, another important element in Gaganyan program is the environment and life support system. When you carry human beings up there, so when you carry human beings in a, in a rocket, you need to maintain the temperature, you need to supply them with oxygen, you need to remove the carbon dioxide, you need to remove the waste, you need to ensure their physical health parameters are monitored, you need to have fire control and suppression system. So we call it life support system or environmental control and life support system. And who will design it? Rocket engineers? Absolutely not. It has to be designed by people who understand human physiology. And ISRO is not having such people. So we went to US, we went to Russia, why don't you supply some of them? You know, already know. So they said, okay, we will consider. So this also we have to develop inside for developing a human space flight. And the ability to bring back the crew safely to Earth, it's very easy to launch somebody. You know, if in one of the rockets, if you put somebody, it will definitely go to orbit. I have no doubt about it. But there is no guarantee that they will be brought back safely. They will have to sustain the acceleration. They have to sustain the vibration. Their accommodation has to be very safe. And you should have a good algorithm to bring back and land at the required uh, approach velocity. If it doesn't happen, it, that fellow will be dead long, long before. So safety of the crew becomes very important. 
even today though americans have done it in 1960s for a new nation to do a human space flight it's a very complex task and we are on that now and we are working with so many institutions in this country to develop this capability we also did while we were doing this human space flight we also did simplified things this is a rocket called small satellite launch vehicle we developed it for the industry and this is developed at one tenth the cost of PSLV development. And this has almost 50% of the payload capability of the PSLV for industries to launch small satellites. And we are going to transfer to industries to develop this rocket and manufacture this rocket so that it can, it can really help you to, en to increase the commercial potential of Indian launches. Equally important is to bring about reusability. So if you look at cost of launching, it used to be very high. For any nation to work on space technology, you need to invest hugely. While the Cold War was waging between US and USSR, you know what, what was one of the biggest problems US faced? In developing the infrastructure for doing space, they had to invest almost one third of their gross domestic product for space activities. And while they were doing the moon missions in, the, in those times, the burden on the exchequer was so high that they had to close down the whole program. And it happened in Russia also. You know, when the space shuttle development happened in US, Russians tried to develop another shuttle called Buran. I think many of you may be knowing about Buran story. It was launched only once. After that, they shelled the whole program. Because it is not sustainable for any nation to continue such a complex problem, complex development or operation of it. Even space shuttle was closed down by the Americans because it was prohibitively costly. But everything has changed recently. The launch cost has come down substantially now. Who did it that? Who, anybody, anybody can tell why, how it happened? The launch cost of rockets are today much, much lower than those times of the space shuttle era. What brought out that change? It is Elon Musk. Elon Musk, he showed that reusable rockets are possible. It was thought to be impossible once. And, and because of reusability, today the launch costs are only $5,000 $5, per kilogram or even lower than that. It used to be $20,000, $50,000 per kilogram. Today it is much cheaper. But there are winged reusables still being developed in US, in Russia, in Europe, and in China. And we are also into wing reusable, but it is different than space shuttle. The type of technology used in space shuttle is no longer used here. They are high temperature materials, reentry materials, but it's going to be autonomous. No human being is going to fly in this. It's going to be a robotic air, aircraft. We are also working on air breathing, rocket engines. This is also equally important. While we talk about rockets, it's equally important to talk about satellites. I think different satellites development has happened in, in, in ISRO over the years. Communication satellites, uh, observation, Earth observation satellites, navigation satellites, as well as scientific satellites. We have, uh, we have currently almost 53 satellites in orbit of different class. And many of them doing all your television broadcasting, uh, DTS services all are on ISRO satellites. It also does the communication support for the BSNL backhaul data transfers, not for telephone networks, but for data linkages, VSAT connectivities, banking transactions, ATM purposes, etc. So many of the communication satellites are observing, uh, supporting those activities. And our Earth observation satellites are for civilian as well as strategic need. Civilian needs, all of you know, we do the cartography, we do the agricultural measurements, we look at the water resources, we look at uh, survey records, uh, updates. But equally important are the strategic. You look at the numbers. The strategic side is much bigger than the civilian. And it is needed for the nation. We need to look at the boundaries of the nation and continue to observe it for changes and threats. And we have navigation satellites. The Indian regional navigation system, which is called NAVIC today, it is a a potential replacement to GPS, for especially for the strategic sector. When GPS can be denied by some operator, when, when we are in the critical need, India felt that we should develop our own uh, position, navigation, and timing service. And that, the Navi came into picture. And of course, the scientific missions that we have today. Today, the, the locations where we put the communication satellites are really crowded. Just imagine on top of India on the equator at 36,000 kilometers, this many satellites are placed now. Almost, uh, they are so close to each other. And they are even co-located at some places. At the same location, they are placed few kilometers away. 
to do the communication services because these slots which you see there are very precious national assets and they are allocated by International Telecommunication Union to you based on a very strong negotiation with other nations. It's just not that you can go and then occupy any location on space like that. So it's another big uh, international competition to place your satellites at the right slot. The navigation satellites are also placed at the same orbit, but there are eight of them and they are not stationary there. They are actually moving from north to south in like an eight. And they continue to provide us the position, timing and navigation services. And many of you may not know that our navic accuracy is, is far superior to GPS. And recently you heard that it is coming up in the Apple phone 15 also. The navic is slowly getting inducted. And we have made a major change in the navic in the recent times to inject new frequencies, new encryption algorithms to ensure it is more secure and more accurate. We also have earth observation satellites of various types. And our earth observation system is thematic in nature. Thematic means it looks at one sector by sector by sector. Because if you have to have satellites to look at different sectors, for example, if you want to look at land and water, we need a certain spectral characteristics. The spectral means you have to observe the emittance, image, the radiation from the surface in its, in its visible infrared, near ultraviolet or even other bands also. Sometimes in radio waves or microwaves as well. So we have high resolution images and high resolution is required only for visible mostly. Then we have ocean observations which looks at ocean temperatures, ocean color, ocean wave heights the, and also wind vectors on the ocean. And we have weather climate type of satellites which looks at the formation of the cyclones, it looks at the water, water content in the, in the atmosphere and it also looks at the wind pattern, etc. So basic thematic satellites have been developed and possibly you know that all these satellites including its sensors, camera, detectors, everything is developed by our own people in India. It's not purchased from anywhere. And all this data is not only built here, we post it in a public domain site called Bhuvan. If you go to Bhuvan, just Bhuvan, you type in, you will be able to go to the site and understand the site. But if you want to download data, you need to register as a user. The entire data pertaining to India is all available in Bhuvan of various nature, various layers, various themes. It's not only the deep, now your Google map type information, but it is much more deeper information. So it is slightly difficult for you to operate and then find out like a Google map. Google Maps gives you the roads and networks, etc. But Bhuvan gives you much more information like the forests, it will give you the water bodies, it will give you the agricultural lands, it will find out the desertification, it will look at the water moisture, it will look at the depth, etc. So much of information. Now let me go to the another topic which is the scientific missions. So though we mentioned about the communication, remote sensing, navigation, but equally important is the scientific missions. And it has got prominence in the recent times. Because it is it's so inspiring story to talk about scientific missions, you know, going to moon and finding out some something very phenomenal. So it started with the Chandrayaan 1. And all the credit goes to Dr. Madhavan Nair, who was a chairman at that time, to convince the government to do this such a mission, Chandrayaan 1. And when we had no capacity to do going up to the moon, just imagine we had only a rocket called PSLV at that time. And using PSLV to go to moon, ah, people would have just told ah, it is a foolish thing, you know. We, don't, we have hardly 1.5 ton capacity in a, in a PSLV to launch a uh, sun-synchronous polar orbit. How you can go up to moon? And a very unique way of going to moon was devi devised that nobody has done it before. And we launched it to an earthbound orbit. Then it was slowly raised using the propulsion within the satellite and finally captured by the moon and finally brought to the moon orbit of 100 km. Very unique way of doing the mission management. And we still continue to do that. We still continue to do that for Chandrayaan 2 and 3 using the same technology. So the satellites have grown bigger from the early 1.2 ton mass. Now it is almost 4.5 ton mass when you went to Chandrayaan 3. And Astrosat. I think the community here may not be ever knowing about Astrosat. You would have heard about Astrosat. Astrosat is a unique observatory we launched. I can call it like the Hubble Space Telescope of India. I think nobody has named it like that, but I am calling it like that. Though it is not as big as Hubble Space Telescope, it doesn't have an optics as big as a Hubble Space Telescope, but it's very unique because it has capacity to observe the same events at large spectral bands. So it gives you so much of information on various aspects, which I will quickly show you. Mars Orbital Mission. 
again it is being heralded as one of the unique accomplishment of india going to mars and succeed in its very first attempt no other country in the world has been you know successful in this of course aditya l1 is on its way to l1 hope it will reach by middle of january at the required point l1 and will make history by observing observing sun and not just observing sun all of you are observing sun morning if you get up and look at the sun you can see the sun it is not just going to l1 point and look at the sun it is going to look at the sun in a way that none of you can ever look at it see for example if you want to look at sun and then understand the coronal mass ejection you need to have a solar coronagraph and it was developed here then you are going to look at sun in the ultraviolet domain so you look at an ultraviolet telescope and look at sun and understand how it is behaving then we put another instrument to look at the soft x rays that are coming from them then another instrument to look at the hard x rays that are coming from them and there are two more instruments to look at the particle emissions from them electrons protons higher ions how they are coming and when a solar coronal ejection happens and a final instrument to find out how the magnetic influences of this emissions create in the vicinity around the satellite so a suite of instruments which actually measures connected relative measurements which understand the physics of this solar coronal emissions and its influence on earth i think all of you will be very keen to know about chandrayaan's i think chandrayaan has become a great story to speak to young people but it's an inspiring story of developing chandrayaan 1 chandrayaan 2 and chandrayaan 3 and i am really proud to be part of that journey of doing this of course i was not part of the chandrayaan 1 team where we had only a very small role to develop the moon impact probe so that when i speak about chandrayaan 1 i must speak about uh, dr apj abdul kalam oh it's going somewhere sorry i am going back okay uh, when i go talk about chandrayaan 1 I must talk about the Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam. He played a very important role at that time. At that time, he was the President of India. And when Madhav Nair proposed this idea to Abdul Kalam, Chandrayaan 1, we are going to go, then he suggested. By that time, Chandrayaan was almost getting ready. It was only a few months to launch. Then uh, Kalam suggested, if you are going to moon, you should put something on the moon. Huh? You put some Indian flag on the moon and come back. Don't go and go around the moon and go, go do something there. Immediately, the... Uh, the team uh, assembled together what you can do on the moon uh, by going and impacting on the moon and they immediately a payload called moon impact probe was designed in which a small unit will separate out of the moon uh, uh, chandrayaan 1 and will move towards moon and will impact on the moon and while the whole travel is going to take place there will be scientific measurements there will be observation there will be camera all of this will be done and so we'll collect some scientific data as well and it was designed and realized in few months of time and it was launched in chandrayaan 1 so we had the first flag of india on moon while chandrayaan 1 was launched so that's what <laughs> of course chandrayaan 2 was launched there were many many new things that need to be done it was not just chandrayaan 1 we had a new two units the lander the rover the propulsion module or called the orbiter all this had to be newly developed and a new rocket also came into picture the gsl mar 3 and i am very happy that i used to be the first project director of the rocket when it was developed so when it was destined to be launched we had a discussion which rocket should be used for this launch and we were ready to offer chandrayaan 2 launch on the very first operational flight of lvm 3 and that was successful and it took lifted almost 4.5 tons to the earth bound orbit and later it reached moon but of course all of you know the story of chandrayaan 2 that it couldn't do the soft landing on the moon very first time but its orbiter is performing very very well and because we did chandrayaan 2 and we have a very high resolution image of moon today 25 cm resolution which is one of the highest resolution camera that we have and because of that image today we know the craters where they are the the boulders are where so we can land very safely on the moon and this image is captured and the entire landing area is now put into chandrayaan 3 for it to do the perfect landing this time it's not only the not only the landing which is important the scientific objectives of moon missions are equally important so while we designed the chandrayaan 1 a call for scientific experiments was given world over and in the mission there were instruments from us instruments from europe and indian instruments as well and you can look at the electromagnetic spectrum 
The instruments were designed to cover the entire range of electromagnetic spectrum to observe moon in, in this whole of this bound. I am not going to explain that. Primarily, you look at the scientific interest and all these instruments came just because of this capability, we found water on the moon in the Chandrayaan mission, one mission. So it's very important decision. So the image of the water presence, water is not present as water there. It's not possible for water to exist. It's present as hydroxyl molecules or trapped into the materials. So the entire hydroxyl and water molecule content was found out by the NASA instrument as well as Indian instruments at that time. And Chandrayaan 1 also gave so many other new ideas, the 3D image of the craters which we mentioned. We also measured volcanic lava flows on the surface of the moon uh, and the presence of the water, of course, is well known. All of you know it. And when it came to Chandrayaan 2, Chandrayaan 2, the new rocket was used. It had three components, the orbiter, lander and the rover. And, you know, beautiful images came out of that. Today we have a huge image database of moon, which, which only one country, I think US only has similar resolution images of moon today. But of course, you know the Chandrayaan 2, the landing process was, of course, the last minute we had a uh, problem and it crashed on the surface of the moon in the terminal phase. And the whole analysis of this whole failure, I, I think I have given a presentations on this earlier, so I don't want to venture on that part of it, what technically went wrong in the whole process of landing. But what is most important is the the understanding of the whole process of landing is, is much better today. That's why we were able to land perfectly in Chandrayaan 3 today. You know, in, in moon, landing is still difficult. Even if people have gone there long, long back, people have landed on the moon and they have come back. But landing on the moon is still very complex. Why, why it is so? One reason is that there is no atmosphere. The moment there is no atmosphere, you have a difficulty. Because you can't use a deceleration that is possible through the track. So there are no aerodynamic surfaces will help you. Either wings or drag devices or parachutes, none of them can be used. Then the gravity field of moon is again funny. It's not very symmetric gravity. You know, every spherical object has a gravity field which is coming out of its mass, mass but the mass distribution of the moon is not uniform around. It has so many harmonics. It is heavy at one edge, it is light at some other edge. The density of the material within the moon is not uniform. So when the orbit of the satellite is, it's actually moving in in, in wave mode. The height of the orbit variation typically 20 kilometers. So the error on landing can be very very high if you don't compute it properly. So the orbital mechanics part of this or moon is actually tricky. The harmonics, the higher harmonics of the gravity field model of the moon has to be used. So all of this cannot be simulated on ground. That's another problem. If you want to really create a landing process of the craft on the moon, how do you really create? And of course, the gravity is only one-sixth of the of Earth. And I don't have a... It's impossible to create a gravity field which is less than Earth at any place. You can only counteract with some counter forces. But if you put a counter force, it has its own dynamics that gets into the system and corrupt the whole landing process. Again, the issue of uh, the mass and propulsion and other interactions come in. But all these were addressed to some extent in Chandrayaan 2. But still, we had some lacuna. And this lacuna is what is corrected in the Chandrayaan 3 mission. And we found out why more and more number of tests are important for us to understand. But the Chandrayaan 2 gave us beautiful images. I am just showing you some images to explain. Even it found out there are craters which is not visible from optical images. Now you look at this. Those marked locations, one has a crater, but it is not visible in the photo. So if you really use a synthetic aperture radar to scan the surface of the moon, you will find places where there are craters which is not visible. So a lot of such findings that came out of Chandrayaan 2, I am not speaking about the scientific things, but the one which is visible and now, for, now available to non-technical non people, only I am talking about, but you are all technical people, of course I know. <coughs> I just want to speak about just one experiment that we did, the Ch Chase 2, which found out uh, the very, very spatial heterogeneity and influence of the various elements in the, in the surface and also the beautiful 3D image of the Sarabhai crater, which we found out using Chandrayaan 2. This is named later as Sarabhai crater. Now let me go to Chandrayaan 3. Uh, when he came to Chandrayaan 3, the journey of Chandrayaan 2 has been in our mind. It was in 2019. So the very first year we did on the failure analysis, tried to find out what went wrong with Chandrayaan 2, understood what all things had to be modified, and for the next two years we worked on 
the improvements in the Chandrayaan 2 and the last year the flight integration and testing has happened. So it took long time to correct the problem and then come back with the Chandrayaan 3. Like Chandrayaan 2, the process was similar. Take off from SDSC Shar, which is very nearby, and then using LVM3, and the launch took place on 14 July. We went to earthbound orbits, which you've seen there. And after five earthbound maneuvers, you know why we had to go around and around and earth to do this? Because you need you need only the least energy to raise an orbit when you do this at its perigee point. So your apogee can go higher and higher with the least energy addition which is in the, in the arc, you do the instantaneous energy at a point, you do the best imp impulse addition, but you do in a sh short arc, you can do it very, very efficiently. If you do throughout the burn in the full arc, there will be a lot of arc losses. So somebody who has an interest in orbital mechanics can study this and find out why it is so. Then finally, we reached moon after a journey of almost five days after the translunar injection, and it has to be captured by the moon. The only trick here is, once you leave Earth and then go to Moon, Moon should be there. If the Moon is not there, what will happen? Then it will overshoot and go away. So your calculation has to be precise. On the day of the launching, Moon is somewhere else. And by the time the translunar injection happens and, and the five days later the Moon reaches there, Moon has to reach there. But fortunately the mathematics is so good and the old equations of motion are very good so that the orbital mechanics of two-body problem can be perfectly solved today. So it reaches there and the moon also comes there on that day. So that is good that our mathematics modeling is all very good. It was captured by the moon. And then slowly from a bigger elliptical orbit, it was brought back to in by step by step process to a 100 kilometer orbit. And then after 100 kilometer orbit, this time we did lot of tests while it was in the 100 kilometer orbit, which was not done in Chandrayaan 2 time. We tested the engines, we tested the sensors, we tested various failure modes to sh make sure that while it happens on 23rd of Ju August, landing process happens, everything in the Chandrayaan 2 was tested and we had great confidence. That's why on the launch day when we were all sitting here, the director of the Shar Center is here, I was there, we were not at having any tension. We were very sure that it is going to land this time. That's why our Honorable Prime Minister Modi ji also joined us. <laughs> Last time when Chandrayaan 2 was landing, he was there physically. This time he was not there physically. So this time he was virtually connected. But then for a prime minister to come for such a great event, he must have confidence in us, no? If it fails on that day, what will be the, what will be the global impact you can think about when a prime minister is attending such a function? So we had such a confidence on this time. And I want to tell you about the lander and the rover. The Vikram lander, it's a beautiful piece of engineering. I think you must all come and see it, at least our prototype at, at URRC one day, the URRC satellite center. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful piece for every domain of expertise. You look at the structures, people, you'll find it very exciting to design how energy-absorbing systems are designed. You, for a propulsion fellow, you'll find its engines, throttling engines, four of them working beautifully with the pressure-fed engine and so precise control of its thrusters. You have inertial system, which is a laser gyro based inertial system and ceramic servo accelerometers giving one of the best ever acceleration sensing in micro-G and also in rates, which is so tiny. It has sensors of various kinds, radar altimeter, laser altimeter, laser based Doppler velocimeter, camera based uh, detection capability, sun sensors, star sensors, thermal protection systems, you name complex systems, everything is there on board. It's a marvelous robotic hardware. And finally, we have mechanisms of various natures to deploy to open pyrotechnics, uh, electrical sensors, hundreds of measurements. And also the inside, the Pragyan, the rover, and the rover is also equally beautiful instruments with its wheel drives of electric motors uh, of this rocker arm design, designed to travel on the moon on the dusty surface. It is designed with its own power generation, battery, and two important scientific equipment, a laser ablation spectrometer, and also a uh, alpha particle based uh, X-ray fluorescence instrument to measure the elemental combustion. Two instruments are also there along with all the equipments to run it. Uh, and its communication equipments as well as cameras, all of them, uh, you know, complex instrument all put in just 32 kilogram mass inside. So that's the beauty of the robot. And also this is tied to the rover lander so, so beautifully and with a tether cable we were releasing it on the surface. Possibly you would have seen the beautiful uh, you know, release of the lander and the rover coming out. And this time when it was landing, 
we took a lot of care to ensure the landing goes very well. In a typical landing process, it's very easy. From a speed of 1.6 kilometers per second, it has to come down to zero kilometers per second in the horizontal direction and vertical not more than two meters per second. So it's a trick of how to change the velocity, horizontal velocity of 1.6 kilometers per second, 1.6 kilometers per second and a vertical velocity of zero to change over to vertical velocity of two meters per second and a horizontal velocity of near zero. And this has to be done over a period of time and this has to be done so optimally to minimize the fuel and to minimize the, uh, the, uh, the inertial control, other requirements while meeting all this. So the optimal optimization problem is a problem which can be solved mathematically. But that issue here is you need to make sure the instruments are really working. So the optimal trajectory is not used here. We are used a suboptimal route to land. So those who do deal with optimization problem understand how to formulate an optimization problem and solve a trajectory problem of this nature. But in this case, we had hovering. The moment the hovering is introduced, it becomes non-linear. It cannot be handled that easily. The whole guidance problem becomes much more complex. You need to reach a hovering condition, keep the whole craft stationary, and send, send sensing like uh, altimeters and the lidars to work and then check all of them are giving the good data. If it's not giving the good data, switch over to some other instruments, then take an alternate path. So all these possibilities were built into this. And even at 150 meters, which is above this, it will take images of the surface and make sure it is going to land not on top of a boulder. It's not going into a crater. And if something is wrong, it has an ability to shift it to almost 150 meters on sideways. It actually did a few meters, it's, it's, it's shifted to look for a better place to land. So all these capabilities are built into it. So while we are designing the algorithm to land the whole process, it has to have all these capabilities. And while we're doing it, we have to take care of what went wrong last time. Last time, the whole craft tumbled because of certain algorithmic errors. And we made sure this time, whatever may happen, even if an algorithmic error happened, it will still land somehow, somewhere, on the moon. This was a design we made. <laughs> and it actually landed, uh, that the landing area was four kilometers by 2.5 kilometers along the track. It is four kilometers and 2.5 kilometers across the track. Last time it was only half a kilometer by half a kilometer. And there was an algorithmic problem last time that it was trying to force the craft to go and land at precisely that location. And that was a big problem. The craft was trying to go there, but it has no time to reach up to that. So it was trying to increase its speed to reach there while its speed of you know, vertical speed was going on increasing. So it's a combination of speeds, no? Horizontal and vertical speeds have to be perfectly matched to maintain the orientation. This couldn't be done last time. This was a fundamental algorithmic error last time. So this time we corrected that algorithmic error and told this craft that your job is to land perfectly this time, not really land at the place that you are asked to land. If there is an abnormality comes in, land wherever it is. So this is a condition that we imposed on the whole algorithm. And it worked this time. None of the contingencies were invoked. None of the redundant systems were invoked. The entire mission happened in the primary chain with all the instruments working beautifully. That's why when you plan contingencies, it will never come. That is how beautiful it is. And if you think and plan too many possibilities of going wrong, everything will be all right. So this is a part of a space mission technology that you should do your job well, so the instrument will work in its best way whenever you do your job very well. <clears throat> now, another important thing was ro rover planning. While after landing, we have to do the rover planning. And this is also, you know, many of you who are working in robotics must know how uh, optical images are coming and based on this, you have to have path planning on the rover. This was done in real time to move around. When we actually moving the Pagyan, we found in front of that there was a big crater. If it have moved a little more, it would have fallen into it. So after analyzing the image, this whole path planning was done beautifully. And also this time, Chandrayaan-3 had beautiful instruments which couldn't be used in Chandrayaan-2. Chandrayaan-2 had instruments on board the orbiter, but the lantern and the rover instruments were never put to use because we, it, we had a crash landing. Very interesting instruments, the REMBA, which is measuring the, the electron density around the moon's surface. And Chaste, which actually pierces the surface of the moon and measures the thermophysical characteristics of the lunar regolith. The ILSA is an accelerometer instrument, which is a MEMS accelerometer, tri-directional. It measures the acceleration, basically the earthquake type of, or the mooncake type of you know, events that are happening inside the core of the moon that was measured. And we had two other instruments on rover, the Apex as well as LIPS. The Apex is an alpha particle based 
uh, X-ray fluorescence instrument which measures the part, the elemental composition. And the LIPS is a laser ablation, which actually we send a diode laser on the surface of the moon. It evaporates some of the materials. You do a spectroscopy and find out what is the moon material content there. And there is another instrument called shape payload, which actually measures the earth spectral characteristics to ca find habitable planet behavior. So all these instruments collected huge amount of data uh, from the Chandrayaan-2. And this is one example of such a such an instrument, which is Ramba, which measured and found out very different measurement than we ever expected. For example, if we found the electron density on the surface of the moon is supposed to be very high as per theoretical predictions, but we measured very low. And some scientists have to come out with the reason why it is so tomorrow. Now let me go to the next mission, the Mars Orbiter mission. All of you know that this has been a very unique mission, first in the Asia and third in the world. And this is the first nation ever to succeed in its first attempt. And a lot of outcome, outcome came out of Mars Orbiter mission. Mars Orbiter mission was planned for just one year to last. You know, when the mission design was planned that it will be around Mars for one year and we'll collect all the data. You know, it, was, it worked for eight years without any problem. And its fuel ran out. And then we had to decommission that uh, satellite just few months back. And Mars Orbiter is now no longer functioning. But we had beautiful scientific outcome and the best part of is, we have a 3D image of Mars today in high resolution. Nobody has this, such a beautiful image. And you look at the Phobos, the satellite of Mars, the image taken by the color camera of the Mars orbiter uh, mission. And also many, many 3D images, I'll show you some of them. Yeah, this is one of the 3D images of the Mars that we have from the Martian camera. And you can see the Mars was once flowing with water. I think that's everybody knows today that there were rivers and all of this uh, at, uh, at some point in time in Mars and all of them vanished one day. I don't know why it happened. You know, Mars is almost similar to Earth and its gravity is almost 0.8 plus. Its diameter is almost similar. Its periodicity or rotation is approximately 24 hours. Its temperatures are having some, it has some atmosphere which is just one hundredth of the thickness of uh, Earth atmosphere. I believe one day the atmosphere would have been as much as Earth, but due to some physical reason, it actually vanished. It can happen to us. I think what is making atmospheres vanish? Today, there's a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere on Mars. If you don't understand why it, can, why it is happening, one day we will also be not having any atmosphere. And with that, the life will cease to exist here. So it's even better study and find out why Mars is like this. AstroSat is another instrument, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's another in a uh, very interesting uh, observatory with five different telescopes. It is still continuing to do its scientific missions and providing fantastic observations uh, even today. What exactly is measuring, you know? It looks at black holes, it looks at nebula, it looks at stellar explosions, it looks at uh, creation of new stars. I think all these are happening and beautiful images came out of the AstroSat and these are only known to the scientific community who deals with uh, the, such cosmological findings. Now I'll talk about Aditya L1. Aditya L1, I already mentioned that Aditya L1 is on its path to L1 point, and it is an, it's a satellite with very different suits of instruments to find out the coronal mass ejection of the sun and to capture the behavior and finally help us to monitor related measurements. Why I, I'll tell you a little more detail about it. Suppose I can measure the magnetic field around the Earth changes. I can connect to the solar coronal mass ejection today once the Aditya L1 gives you a beautiful data. We can also observe the soft X-ray emissions and related to the solar mass injection. So we don't need the whole suite of instruments after some time to characterize the sun impact on uh, the Earth's uh, space weather. So that's the beauty of Aditya L1. Now let me quickly go to some other new missions which we are in the planning. The first mission is ExpoSat. This satellite is already built and it is waiting for launch. It's called X-ray polarimetry satellite. And this will be launched using a PSLV. And this satellite is going to study pulse polarimetry of bright X-ray pulsars. Those who know the astronomy a little bit, you know what is a pulsar. And pulsars generally emit the X-rays. And here we are not just looking at the X-rays. We are looking at the polarimetry of X-rays, which gives you a different information. For example, pulsars or the dying stars, it starts you know, eating from the adjacent stars. You know, there will be mass moving out from the adjacent stars. And this mass is being pulled into the 
black holes, there will be emission of X-rays and this emission of X-rays will give you a polarimetry of this X-rays will give you a better understanding of the quantity, quantity of the mass being ejected. So this is a very important payload which is developed by some of the scientists to understand this particular phenomena. SpaceX is another mission which is we are which is just getting ready. Satellites are getting integrated now. And this is the first robotic docking mission that we are going to do in space. Two separate satellites, they will be assembled and launched. And in orbit, they will separate out, then travel uh, a few hundreds of kilometers, again come back and dock at the using a separate docking system. So we have developed a robotic docking facility, a zero gravity docking facility in our lab where it will run on you know, air bearings and they will go and talk using a uh, chaser uh, and grabber approach and this will be demonstrated future for our docking missions for human space flight will be done using this. We are planning new missions called Disha, Venus Orbiter, Mars Lander, all these are in planning and this is not for anybody who is noting it, don't announce that these are going to be launched by ISRO. We are in the planning phase where we are trying to find out scientists who have an interest in this so that we can actually plan this mission and I have to go to government to get approval for this. It all requires huge money and government need to give us money and only when there is a sufficient talent pool capable of using the scientific data and I need to convince the decision makers in the government, yeah, better fund us so as to do this project work. So I am going around and talking about people, yeah, we need to do such missions, it is important for the country, you, I am talking to the scientific organizations in this country to come up with the, how you can make use of this mission for advancing science in India. So this is a primary role, so Disha is a dual aeronomy mission where we launch two satellites and look at the longitudinal and latitudinal variation of space weather. And space weather is going to be important in the future. When you have hundreds of satellites, they affect the satellites. For example, the magnetic radiations, solar coronal mass ejections, all these affect the satellites, especially electromagnetic spectrum. It affects the power circuits uh, of the nations, especially in the northern and southern hemisphere, wherever nations southern, of course, there is only Australia. In the northern side, you can see in Canada and all that, there are power outages due to solar coronal activity. And Venus orbiter is a, it's a very important scientific interest because many nations are going to Venus and we want to go to Venus as a very important mission. Mars lander is another goal that we want to go to Mars, land and bring back some uh, materials from there and to study the future. <clears throat> we are working on another mission called LUPEX. LUPEX is a mission to go to moon again, but this is along with Japan. Japan has offered that they will give the launch using their rocket. The lander will be Indian lander and the rover will be a Japanese rover. So we are working together to see this mission possible. And we are looking at further astronomy missions and another mission called ExoWorlds. ExoWorld is an interesting mission which I will explain a little later. This is the Disha details, so I am not going to speak about it. Is there any scientific interest on Disha aeronomy mission from here? Of course, we can come and we will discuss it uh, with you very specifically. ExoWorld is an interesting mission. Here we are going to look at exosolar planet. How many of you have heard about exosolar planets? I think many of you know, must be knowing. Exosolar planets are the planets of some other stars other than sun. So every star today we know that has planetary system. It was thought never to be there like that. So planets are very rare things we thought. But we today we know by observing thousands and thousands of stars, planetary system exists in most of the stars. So that's a new finding and many of those stars have potential to hold an earth-like condition. Till now almost 5000 exosolar planets have been discovered in that hundreds of them have a potential to hold atmosphere, water, presence and possibly living organisms there, maybe aliens as well. So if you have to know about it, you must have methods to observe it, find out whether there will be some living system. How do you know about it? Because the electromagnetic waves comes from that and that they are millions of light years away, sometimes hundreds of light years away, I won't say millions, few thousands of light years away. So we need to look at the spectral characteristic of these planets through the light that comes through the atmosphere, thin atmosphere of those planets. Once it is moving in front of the planet star, the light through that will slightly get modified and you will do the spectroscopy of that light and find out what type of elements are there in the atmosphere. And you can find out whether there is water, there is oxygen, there is carbon dioxide. So it's a beautiful scientific instrument that we are trying to develop to look at planets, especially exosolar planets. We have a lot of such programs which are you know, tied up in the, in the future. 
to look at science exploration as a major theme. And we are also working with many nations. We are working with France, we are working with Russia, we are working with uh, Japan, we are working with the NASA to develop new payloads and new instruments. And one of the in interesting payload which is currently getting integrated, this at Bangalore, NISR, NISR we call it, say, ISRO NASA Synthetic Aperture Radar. It's a very unique, very complex satellite. The, the costliest satellite ever built for Earth observation in the world is this satellite. Americans have spent huge amount of money, Indians have spent huge amount of money to build this satellite. What is this satellite? This is a radar satellite and the S-band radar comes from India, the L-band radar comes from US and we merge these two and this put in a satellite and we have a huge antenna, 18 meter diameter antenna which will be deployed in space and this will continue to develop, you know, monitor Earth to find out so many things on Earth. The tectonic movements, the water stressing, you know, you understand the if you, if you start taking water from earth in heavy numbers, your, your land sinks and it will, it will go up in meters. Many people don't know that your surface actually moves up and down in meters with cyclic variations of water under the, under the earth. And this can be very precisely measured only if you have very high accuracy measurements in multiple radar bands. And this is the beauty of it. And it does many more measurements which are important for the, uh, for the understanding. We also conduct so many research, not only in space, from land also. So we have so many laboratories across the country, balloon facilities, uh, uh, mesosphere, stratosphere, radars. We have observatories across the country. Even in Hanley, we have optical observatories. Uh, we have the radio telescope. So we continue to, obs and solar observatories. So all these are, are adding to the capability from space to observe. We look at climatic systems. So climate and weather monitoring is one of the strongest the capability that ISRO is having. We have scientists who are spread across various institutions look at climate and weather. We do ground measurements. Do you think that a space agency has ground measurements? You thought that you are only putting space instruments and measuring. No. We have so many ground measurements. We put uh, carbon sequestration measurements. We look at emissions from the forest to land boundaries. We put towers and continuously measure this data and uplink to satellites. We have stations all across the nation to collect aerosol data and then collect to the satellites and give it to for our scientists. So we do this type of measurements as well. We do ship cruises to find out what is the distribution of the particles moving from land to ocean and ocean to land to find out what are the elements that contribute to the climate and weather. And our scientists go around the globe to do the measurements in the sea. We conduct buoys and floats to collect this data. We also conduct airborne measurements campaigns to understand weather and climate. So, for example, we do sonde research. Sonde is a, is a transmitter that is launched up in the balloon and it collects, collects the data and sends it on a regular basis. And we have huge amount of data which is collected through the sonde processes. And every launch, of course, we do this. And we have, uh, we look at black carbon, very important element. And we do measurements using various instruments using balloon ascents. And this is again a scientific activity which is happening using collaboration with various institutions in this country. We do aerosol studies, aerosol optical depth. You know, when you look at look down, you find that the aerosols present in the atmosphere create optical uh, variations in the in the atmosphere, and we can measure this uh, across the height and find out the transport of aerosols. And aerosols are very important, you know, climate and weather decision, how it plays a role in nucleation of the rain, in look, in deciding the temperature distribution, etc. So this is being studied using various instruments, and it is also a, instruments are placed all across the country. And these are not from satellite. Please don't think that these are from satellite. These are ground-based measurements we conduct to understand the atmosphere and weather. We do studies on radiative impact of clouds. You know how clouds are controlling the weather. It's not why by giving rain. It's simply by the presence of the clouds, you have a radiative uh, forcing function which is varying. And this is studied using various satellites as well as uh, ground-based observations. We also provide capability to you people, young people to put instruments. Suppose somebody in IIT wants to build an instrument and launch. I can offer you that a free ride in one of the PSLV if you are able to build an instrument. Want to build some of these you know, topics which I mentioned, you want to measure the electron density, you want to measure the cloud temperature, you want to do some experiments in space. You don't have to worry about how do you power it, how will you transmit the data, all taken care. You only make the instrument. We, I will give you a free ride in PSLV. So we have been doing it for startups, we are giving for companies to come up in space 
So recently, some companies have launched a very important instrument called Space Debris and Weather Monitoring. And they launched it. And small instrument, they launched it. Immediately, they were able to scale up and become as a commercial operator. I think this is an example by which small startups and companies can try uh, low-cost experiments on board our PSLV. We have a great vision in the, in the, the journey towards 2047. And it, is, and it is in many, many domains. It's not only really limited to whatever I mentioned. We are looking at in exploration, uh, Mars exploration, looking at exosolar planets, possibly a lunar sample return. We are looking at asteroid flyby, a deep space mission. We are looking at long duration human presence in space, which is essential part of the Gaganjan program. A space station, why not one day? An extravehicular activity. We are looking at all electric propulsion. We are looking at constellation satellites, which is possibly Leo Mio constellations. We are looking at global globalizing our NAVIC, which is a very important topic. In orbit servicing and fueling, optical laser quantum communication, solar power, and also equally important is the launcher and other capability development over a period of time. Some of the work which we are doing in robotic activity, which is currently going on, is a is a robot which will go, a tether robot who wants to go and capture some debris and bring back. And this robot is just getting ready in one of these row centers and we'll be launching in one of the PSLV, a tethered robot which will be free to move in space and its own control system to do grabbing. And another robotic activity we are trying to do is a satellite refueling. Currently the design started, if a satellite which is just depleted of the fuel, can we go there and refill the satellite and make it life again? So you, you send another satellite with a lot of storage and small quantity you take and go and fill in another satellite. After that, it goes to another satellite and refill. So you keep a reserve of fuel in the orbit and then continue to serve satellites. So this is another mission. We are also working on human space flight program, which we can further expand. Uh, see, the Gaganyan program is only for launching our astronaut to space and bring them back. But it's not enough. We need to have long duration missions of space. We need to create your own colony for space. You need to have our own laboratory in space for long duration experiments. Possibly some of you may know that why space uh, station like uh, is very important for us. The emergence of new domains like the material science requires people to go to space in zero gravity to do research on material, material development, uh, biological development, medicine development, new molecular synthesis, maybe 3D printing of your organs, etc., etc. So all this requires space for us to go there and work. And this is possible only if you expand the Gaganjan program big away. We are also interested in offering you a space tourism. And so more astronauts can come from this country. They just go on and cross the Kalman line and call yourself an astronaut. Why not? But the ticket cost is a little higher. You need to become a billionaire to, to reasonably fund for it. But some of the people are willing to go even today in India. So there are space tourism activities slowly taking shape. Recently, Blue Origin signed an MOU with Indian Space uh, Authorization Center to come to India and then offer this service. And we should also do that with our own rocket once Gaganyan is up there. Maybe in the future, we have to do much more. We have to do more Gaganyan missions. We should do more Chandrayans. The Chandrayan 3 should not be the last of the Chandrayan, no? Do you want it to be the last Chandrayan? No. We have to, we, we must go to moon again. We must do, explore much more. But we must find a reason for going it. It's not just for pride and prestige we should not go. If you can create a scientific reason for going to moon again, and if it is going to bring any you know, scientific or commercial benefit in the future, definitely it is worth going. And so many people are trying to go. You, you are aware of Artemis program of America? Yeah, Artemis program is looking at creating a moon base and there is an international space station around the moon, frequent go up and down from the moon and possibly launch from moon to Mars, etc. So this is a very, very visible program there. And we should also be competitive enough to handle it at much lower cost Especially Indians are well known for doing it at much lower cost and I am very sure we should be able to do that. And we should also develop future rockets. I think the rockets that we have are conventional expendable rockets. We should bring, bring down the cost of launch substantially like what Elon Musk does. And if you cannot continue doing, if you don't do con continue with a regular rocket, of course, we will be thrown out of the market. So new rockets have to be developed. And maybe one day we should also develop our space station. And it's not a far away dream. Like Kalam said to that the only thing that limits us is our imagination. Doesn't limit its imagination. And our knowledge of all of this may be limited today. But if you really dream to achieve all of this, we are going to reach that level one day. No doubt about it. And for all of this, there are many, many technologies that need to be developed. In ISRO, I am very fortunate to see the type of work that we do. 
during the covid time we had you know real huge increase in research and development activities in fact i personally sat and listened to almost 1000 new r&d development activities in various centers it was really accelerating to see that i just showed some of them expandable you know like uh, deployable structures large deployable structures it's very complex technology i think some of you may be working here i do not know uh, energy storage in the structures and make very large assemblage of structures advanced materials uh, domain the additive manufacturing domain sensors robotics air breathing technology electric propulsion advanced electronics i think all of these are very important for us to you know, further our space program and all these activities are happening today and this is happening not only in isro but also in private so let me conclude my talk today once you talk about indian space enterprise by 2047 when you look at the amrit kal when you move towards that in space sector we would like to make india a leading space faring nation i think this is our first requirement and india should become a manufacturing hub of the space activities in the world everybody who is man to manufacture space sector should come to indian manufacture because we we can do it much better than anybody does i think that is one of the next goal we should also become a startup destination you know today there are almost 200 startups in space in building rockets one is there in iit chennai there are many others there are companies who are building start satellites there are companies deploying applications so this should become a startup nation in space and it should also become an innovation in place for space technology as space technology today what we need today is innovation in space the conventional way of doing things have already vanished i think possibly you know i will just tell you one innovation i recently came across mobile phones mobile phones you does it talk to satellite directly today you don't have no Now your regular mobile phones always communicate to a tower it's a cell technology today but i came to know that somebody is launching a satellite with the cell technology that you are directly communicating the satellite it is not not knowing which is whether it is coming from tower or it is coming from satellite and the satellite is not an ordinary satellite it's 60 meter in length 40 meter in wide like a sheet it will be rolled and then going to space it will simply expand as a huge antenna and it will provide you you know dynamic cell technology that it will send a beam to the earth and create a cell like a tower creates and irrespective of whether the satellite is moving or not the cell will remain stationary by an appropriate beam steering look at the technology beautiful technology so once this is launched you will you will be able to use your satellite mobile phones just like that it's connected to satellite without much latency of signals so that's the type of innovation that you have to bring in you have to also make our our space activities very low cost design and a production place our cost cutting methodology that we have proven in isro must become very common everywhere so what i wish today is let new generations industries come forward and create a vibrant space industrial revolution in this country thank you so much for this opportunity <laughs> What we need is for the spectacle of knowledge, and we thank you, Dr. Sona, for gracing us with that. With this, we come to the end of the evening. We thank each and every one of you for joining us today. I request your students, professors Satyendra and, and Gumadi, to felicitate our guests with a moment.
would like to express our gratitude to everyone who has made this event a great success. We hope everyone had a great time and we look forward to more such great vendors ahead. Thank you, thank you all. I request the EMA team members to join us on stage for a photograph with the dignitary.